I need some traction. You need some traction. So hey everyone, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Boast AI. To, and Traction Comp, today's Traction webinar is brought to you by Boast AI Launch Academy in partnership with Growth Lasers, Founder Institute, Lazaridis Institute, and BCF Ventures. Super, super hot topic today. If you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A tab as we go along. We'll try to take them either as we go along or at the end. And feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. What's your name? Where your company is based? Where you're based? And what you're looking to get out of this session? It's going to be... Uh, phenomenal session full of great knowledge bombs here. And um, who better in the house than the two guys who've written the playbook? You got Patrick, who was early, early at Twilio, where they were less than 50 people. They had less than 14 people on the product team. And Patrick led product all the way through Twilio's post IPO and 1800 people. And today he's investing in, in great companies, great founders. And most of your portfolio companies have been usage based right yeah yeah absolutely yeah awesome. su super super excited for this uh this chat and uh to talk talk a bit about usage awesome and then on the other end we have kyle um who was pretty much written all the great playbooks on usage based pricing and and the stats here from OpenView and kyle is that you know is is the end of subscription pricing near i mean like research shows that Usage-based pricing companies grow 38% faster. And of all the IPOs over the last few years, seven out of nine of them had the best net dollar retention were all usage-based pricing models. And, and Kyle, he leads OpenView's growth team. He's responsible for advising portfolio executive teams on strategies to increase revenue growth and dominate their markets. And the team has helped the portfolio companies generate over a hundred million in additional enterprise value in the last three years. So welcome, Patrick, and welcome, Kyle. Um, I'm like a third wheel, so I'm going to mute myself and get out of the way. So Kyle and Patrick run the show. So without further ado, guys, take it away. Great. Thanks, Lloyd. Uh, well, it's good timing, too, because uh, one of our portfolio companies, Cyprus, in the developer testing space, just launched usage-based pricing uh, last week. So it's uh, very timely. But uh, Patrick, you know, Usage-based pricing feels like a really hot topic right now. I think uh, Bessemer called it one of the go-to-market plays for the new normal of SaaS. Uh, TechCrunch has been writing about it a lot. But if you kind of rewind to the early days at Twilio, uh, the model was not kind of tried and true at that point. What I guess what gave you guys conviction uh, to go with usage-based pricing and and how did that work out uh, in the uh, in the early days? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that that um, you know is most attractive about usage based pricing and, and why we had you know such conviction around it um, early on, and and particularly when it was a lot less proven, right? There were, weren't weren't publicly traded companies that were were doing this, was just that it was very customer aligned, right? And if you think about sort of just the core tenet of, of usage based pricing is like you get paid when the customer is using the product and getting value out of it, and so I think you know it really came less from a, hey, this is a super efficient go-to-market strategy, uh, and really just from a, hey, it, it seems like it would be a good idea for us to be, you know, aligned with the success of our customers, right? And so if you sort of think about like what was happening prior to, you know, that it was a lot of, you know, contracts that were sold. Um, a lot of them, you know, I was at Microsoft before I, I joined Twilio, you know, a lot of software projects never got off the ground, right? And so the license would get sold in, the project may or may not have launched. Um, uh, you know, I, I distinctly remember I was at Microsoft in 2008 um, when there was the uh, economic downturn, and all of a sudden we got a ton of cancellations for uh, SharePoint, right? <laughs> um, and it turns out it's really easy to cancel your license when you haven't already deployed. And so, you know, one of the things that I think is is just really great and, and sort of core to, to to why we embrace this at, at Twilio was just that it's aligned with customer success, right? Um, uh, when customers are getting value out of the product, they're using it every day then you're getting revenue from those customers. And so I think that's sort of at, at its fundamental level is sort of the, the, the core benefit of usage-based pricing in terms of, you know, why, why go down that path? Why try and do something different? It, it's, it's really around just making sure the business that you're building is aligned with the success of your customers. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, for me, when I think back to the kind of normal way people think about SaaS products is it's the traditional kind of seat-based subscription model and, when you look at kind of how products are being built right now, increasingly their benefits are either around 
automation for users, uh, their API-based business models, or their uh, you know, AI products to kind of streamline what would be manual processes. And so the value people are seeing isn't necessarily aligned with having more people log in for the software. It's on how they're logging or how they're uh, using the products and, and seeing value uh, as an organization. And I guess uh, you know, my research showed that public companies are growing faster you know, if they have a usage-based model. I think a lot of that's driven by the net dollar retention and their ability to grow as their customers are, are being successful with the products. Uh, but it's not always, uh, you know, that the fact it's kind of not a de facto fact that uh, usage-based companies should be growing faster. Uh, and I think you've seen in the early days, the opposite might be true. How, how are you thinking about uh, how quickly companies grow and, and how a usage-based uh, model impacts that? Yeah, there's um, uh, a quote from, from Einstein that I love, which is that the, the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest. Um, uh, and so who am I to dispute uh, Einstein when it comes to forces in the universe? Um, uh, but the way I sort of think about usage-based uh, pricing is that it, it really is sort of compound interest um, type pricing, right? Um, and so what does that mean for you as someone that, that's building your business? It means that you know, growing at a growth rate um, in the early days that, that you know, let's say the growth rate is, is fairly fixed early days versus later days, it means that actually it, it's really hard to get your first million in, in revenue, right? Um, uh, you know, in, in subscription-based uh, pricing, you can sell a bunch of subscriptions, you can get out there and you can really push the numbers in, in, in the early days. Uh, in usage-based pricing, you really aren't getting paid until the customer is launched, successful, um, and then they're integrated into their product and those products are themselves growing, right? And so um, it's, a, a, I'd say, one of those things where you sort of backload the growth um, in these businesses. The flip side is, as hard as that first million dollars of revenue is to, to go out and get, um, getting an extra incremental million dollars of revenue at, you know, 100 million in, in, in revenue size is, is really effortlessly. The vast majority of that growth now is not a function of your distribution efforts. It's a function of the, frankly, the distribution efforts of their, your customer in terms of whatever it is that they're building. And so particularly for these API type businesses where you're being fully integrated into you know, the products that your customers are building, things like Twilio, things like AWS, things like Stripe, um, it makes it so that the growth rate um, uh, you know, much later on, it's much easier to maintain these sort of high growth rates um, later on in, in sort of the, the, the arc of the, co the, the company. And so I think that's sort of when you look at those, those numbers of publicly traded companies and how rapidly they're growing, I think that's why you see it. It, it. it is in the early days, it's difficult to just to get to that first million. But once you get things going, compound interest, you know, is sort of able to do this uh, on its own. And, and you really end up with these businesses that have sort of three independent growth levers. You have the expansion of the existing usage of the product that you're using today, you have net new customers that you're bringing in, which is sort of the traditional growth lever most companies are expecting. And then you have new SKUs that you add, right? That you can you know, add, add on um, uh, new products and services and sort of cross sell into those accounts. And so um, you end up with, and each of those then has the same you know, baseline growth rate that is the growth rate of your customers. And so uh, it's one of the real powers of these usage-based business models. And I think in particular, they are phenomenal as you've gotten to scale because you can continue to scale growing those, those businesses um, uh, over time. Yeah, I think that's, that's key. I mean, from an investor perspective, we look at net dollar retention being able to show that a company can expand their cohorts, but not all uh, dollar of expansion revenue is created equal. It's very different if you're going and selling to a new BU, a new team, or selling another product into your customers. With a usage-based model, a portion of that, at least, is more organic growth. It's pre-negotiated, it's just the customer is successful, so they're using more of it and you're naturally sharing in that success. And so it's it's not only faster expansion revenue because you have more of these opportunities to grow, but it's even more efficient expansion revenue. But I guess, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, oh, yeah, in particular too, one, one, one of the things just to, to comment on that, in particular, it, it's it's really neat because, you know, in a lot of businesses, you know, when your bill to your vendor is getting too large, you're like, oh, wow, this bill is too large. I shouldn't be paying my vendor so much. It's actually kind of the opposite, um, uh, particularly in the, these horizontal developer platform um, where your infrastructure, right, at the end of the day, 
it means that business is working really, really well. And so um, customers are actually in a very different spot as, the, as their usage of your platform grows. They're happy because it means their business is being successful. And this is sort of to, to the, the initial point I made around sort of aligning with that customer success. It's really, really powerful to be on the side of your customer success as opposed to sort of being a vendor where you have sort of procurement trying to get the best price and, and you're trying to drive down your bill over time as opposed to sort of the world of usage based pricing where it's like as it goes up that's actually generally a good thing for these businesses as well yeah absolutely well and i uh, i think a fear that a number of folks have is that usage based revenue isn't worth as much as subscription revenue because it's not committed it's not locked in uh, but as i talk to investors and even from like the open view investor standpoint i think it's more valuable uh, than committed revenue because it means there's not shelfware in the business you know every amount of revenue that you're generating from usage is actually revenue driven by customers being successful with the platform. You can't hide anything with a usage based model. Uh, and I think it's kind of analogous to going from on prem to SaaS. Uh, it's kind of SaaS to consumption based SaaS. There's not the commitment uh, and you're not necessarily collecting as much cash up front, but you're building a more customer aligned business model. And if you have a sticky product, and customers are using it, you're kind of setting a really strong foundation for future growth that the market will eventually uh, reward. But I guess uh, zooming out, where does this uh, fall down? Wh what businesses you know, aren't right for usage-based pricing or you know, shouldn't be adopting this model? So I, I think it's, a, I don't think it applies to everything. I, I think it's an, a really interesting question though to ask of a lot of businesses, particularly even existing businesses. Um, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, infrastructure businesses and, and why it's so powerful. But, but you know, when we priced a, a, a more recent product from Twilio called Twilio Flex, we did it, um, it's a, a customer uh, support tool and in your agents, you know, typically you have like a, a monthly agent fee, but at, at Twilio we actually priced it per agent hour. Uh, because it unlocked a whole bunch of new use cases, which is like if you had a bursty contact center, all of a sudden, you know, if there are a few hours a day where you need a lot of people uh, manning that contact center, you, you'd be able to 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 be able to do that in, in a way that that makes sense. I think there are though um, places where you know the uh, initial um, you know configuration and sell in is has sort of a high fixed cost, right? And and making sure that you aren't underwater because you don't know that, that every customer is going to expand. And in fact, I think one of the powers of the usage-based business model is that you can have a generous free tier and you can see which customers are successful with the product and, and grow over time. Uh, but not every business looks like that. Some businesses do have a lot of upfront costs for the company to, 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 to just get the, the customer started. And so for those things, it, it might make sense to have sort of an initial subscription fee then paired with sort of a, a usage-based component on top of that as, as they succeed with the, the, the product. And so I do think you need to look at the problem you're solving and where you're creating value for your customer um, uh, and figure out how you, you meet her uh, appropriately. And it, it may in fact be a combo of some initial subscription with then usage that sits on top of that over time to, to, to map to the value that you're, you're creating for your customer. I think the other thing too that, that I've seen folks um, do wrong in, in sort of building out their, their pricing models is that I think a lot of times folks will look at like where their costs sit and exclusively try and sort of meter either a subscription component or a usage-based component sort of around sort of where they're worried about their cost exposure. Um, and, and while it's super important to have an understanding of, of what it costs to run any service that, that you're operating, I think that the more important thing is, is trying to figure out where you're creating value um, uh, and, and making sure that you're metering on those, those units of value. I, sort of the example I give is like, you could have metered on a Twilio API request, but that doesn't actually create value for the downstream customer. What creates value is them getting a text message that reminds them to schedule their next appointment, right? That's actually where value is being created. And so uh, making sure as you think about, even if there's a combination of subscription plus usage, that ultimately all of those are sort of getting back to where the customer is deriving value and, and um, uh, not where you're deriving cost. And, and certainly you need to be aware of that, but, but, but ultimately I think it is uh, far better to, to, to meter on the, the value that you're creating for customers. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and to me, part of that is even ideally that metric shares in the success of your customers and the business outcomes they're trying to achieve. And I think like a classic example is HubSpot 
which is one of those non uh, developer centric companies that has started to monetize more and more based on customer usage. And for them, they used to just have fixed packages like a small, medium and large. And they realized their expansion was abysmal. They were, they were at like a 75% net dollar retention. And they decided to add this additional layer to their pricing about contact-based pricing, where as you generate more marketing contacts from all of the inbound marketing you're doing, uh, you're going to pay more. And that's going to get HubSpot aligned with helping you generate more contacts. And as you generate more contacts, you're going to be able to grow your business. Uh, and that's you know really aligned because your customers are trying to do the same thing that <laughs> you want them to do. And uh, it doesn't feel like a, a tax or... Uh, you know, like you're penalizing them and it's not necessarily just because your costs are structured in a certain way. It's, it's actually based on the value that they're seeing and, and what they want to do. So on this note, how do you advise companies uh, on picking the right metric uh, for, for usage-based pricing and, and what does that process look like in your experience? Yeah, it, it is super tricky. I mean, I think, you know, that there are a bunch of different metrics that I, I sort of um, uh, really drill the, the, the teams at Twilio to, to focus on. I think um, figuring out what that unit of value, I think, is is a, uh, you know, product by product specific exercise, I think, you know, to, to, to understand all the products in the world that could be created and, and uh, know what, what value you're creating for customers is very, very tricky. Um, I think it is important to, to try and experiment, particularly in the early phases of the product. And sometimes you you choose the wrong usage metric um, and you realize that like it doesn't work for this whole class of scenarios that you really wanted to be able to solve. Um, all of a sudden you find out, oh, wow, this is super expensive or wow, we make zero revenue here and we're doing a lot of work. And so um, I do think it's important to, 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 to experiment a little bit in early days um, uh, in, in terms of trying to figure out exactly what the right metering metric is. I think after you sort of arrived at um, what that metric is, I always focus folks to, to sort of look at their business through what is that usage metric that, that you've arrived at? Um, how are you getting more trials into that, um, that particular meter, whatever that is? How are you getting more and more folks started? And is it easy to start? Do you have the appropriate free tier uh, at whatever those usage thresholds have? You know, in the terms of HubSpot, the other advantage that you get from, you know, contact-based pricing is when the business is small, you're not asking for very much money. And when the business is large and you have a big audience, then all of a sudden you're, you're asking for more money. And I think you'll see that play out in, you know, how you set up those, those trials. And so how are you able to get folks in the door, getting the, the start of some small amount of usage and, and uh, having sort of a, a trial there? I also have folks look at sort of new SKU usage. Is there cross-sell opportunities within particular SKUs? You know, at, at, at Twilio, we saw for sure folks would come in, they'd start using Twilio messaging. Um, and that was sort of a, the, the, the right sort of land product for, for most companies. They, they needed it and, and wanted to talk to their customers that way. But then over time, they would start using other products. They'd start you know, building an IVR for, um, in, inside of Twilio. Now, all of a sudden, we'd get voice usage and we'd get cross-sell to other SKUs over time. And I think having an understanding of what that looks like in your business is, is super important because it might lead to an insight of, great, let's lower the the price point and how we think about metering for the land product, because we know it opens the door on the, the demand generation side for a lot of other customer relationships that we can build trust with. Um, and so I sort of have folks take a look at that. And then obviously expansion rate is super important on whatever that, that meter is that you've put in place and having an understanding of what that looks like. But, but just as important is sort of dollar-based and account-based churn, right? Um, when you're having things fall out, why are they falling out? What's going wrong? Um, and all those things together, if you have an understanding of sort of baseline expansion rate, new SKU usage, uh, you know, ability to get new folks in the door, um, uh, that will all sort of lead to uh, essentially a situation where uh, you have the ability to have a pretty good understanding in, uh, around what, what revenue ultimately is going to look like. Um, and, uh, and so revenue to me is really just an output. And I know a lot of folks like to focus on revenue. Um, but for me, revenue is, is just an output um, and, and really not, not, not the core thing to be measuring early on. Yeah, I think those are, those are great uh, call outs. And, and for me, a lot of the testing can be done in more of an interview setting, like qualitatively asking your customers around different metrics you're thinking about charging on. And it's, there's, there's some element of uh, if your customers don't buy into it in an interview or you can't simplify the message, clear enough in a, in a 30 minute conversation, it's going to be really hard for you to sell the product. So it's good, good practice before you even start to 
put your existing uh, revenue at risk. I think from my point, just to kind of double click on a couple of those things, uh, predictability ends up being important for the metric. And so knowing that with a usage-based model, usage tends to grow over time and you know, what uh, if someone's forecasted usage, you don't always hit that um, or you could dramatically exceed it. But the customer needs some element of predictability to have some peace of mind. And so I think like with Snowflake, uh, while you could say their pricing is hard to predict uh, because it's based on kind of compute and uh, it's a little bit technical to, to figure out, they have sales engineers that will help a customer based on what the specific workload is like. They can pretty quickly and very accurately help the customer figure out, okay, based on your workload, here's what you can expect your usage behavior is going to need. And we can give you kind of 5%, 10% headroom in case you, you need to go beyond that. And so it kind of creates some sort of predictability, which puts the customer at ease, even though it's at the end of the day, a usage-based revenue model, and there's going to be some inherent unpredictability. I think the, the other thing I'd add is the feasibility element. Like you have to be able to actually measure it, like monitor it, report on it, charge based on that. And that can be an operational headache. You can have systems that are giving you different insights about the metric or might be a metric that the customer has access to, but you can't measure yourself. Uh, and all of that just creates a ton of pain uh, in, in realizing the benefits of a, of a usage model. So on, on this point, uh, I know there's just a lot of operational, financial, uh, and kind of strategic challenges with adopting a usage-based model. Maybe we'll, we'll start with one. Um, on, on my side, I guess it's the, the element of enterprises and you know enterprises potentially pushing back, procurement wanting, control, predictability in their spend. They, it's hard for them to figure out how to budget for something if there's not a fixed cost. So how have you have you kind of uh, handled that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you know the, the, the points you made around um, both making it uh, predictable and understandable for customers is key. I think you know one of the downsides, and, and certainly um, we had uh, some challenges with this at, at Twilio, is um, uh, it, it can it can not be you can get to a spot where your pricing is not particularly simple. Um, uh, as you have tons of SKUs, all of them have <laughs> variability and you end up in these customer conversations where they're like, well, what's that going to cost me? And you're like, I don't know. And that's not a, a good spot to be in for um, uh, your sales team. It's not a good spot for the customer to be in. And, uh, and so we sort of try to invest a lot in sort of understanding um, for various different use cases you might build out on top of Twilio. What, what the cost of that would ultimately be and, and sort of equipping your team to be able to go in and say like, Here's roughly what this is going to cost. Um, if you start doing, you know, reminders, you will see that, you know, uh, appointments in your your business will drop. You know, uh, appointments that people don't show up to will drop by 20%. And so, you know, the value you're going to create is, you know, um, uh, you're going to have a lot more people uh, making it uh, to their appointments, and ultimately, you're going to be in a spot where, um, you know, it, it will be a worthwhile investment. But we did calculators too for our sales team so that they could um, uh, plug, plug some things in. And then I think the other thing is, is sort of um, uh, working with your team to, to, to be willing to say, is there data you can share us about your business today so we can come up with an actual estimate? You know, um, uh, certainly you know a set of things about your customers and a set of things about your business that, that would be useful for um, trying to be able to predict what, what uh, this would look like if it was integrated into your product and, and not being shy about that. And, and, and many companies, you know, they, they won't share the direct data, but they'll give you some proxy for what that data looks like. And, and, um, and we'd have sort of our sales engineering team sit down with them and be able to sort of produce a model for them um, over time. I think one of the most powerful things, though, is coming up with a model that shows them, you know, uh, the, the value that they create um, uh, from adding whatever this particular component is to their business um, uh, and, and what that, the, the, the business value that creates, like, hey, all of a sudden a bunch of declined appointments aren't happening as a result of your Twilio integration. Well, typically you'll find that, like, you know, building something better and improving your processes in, in, in a particular way is actually just a lot more valuable to the business than what the ultimate cost of that Twilio bill in this case would have been. And so, uh, I think sort of trying to find those opportunities um, uh, and coming up with playbooks where you can sort of talk from customer to customer. You know, there's many, many businesses, the scheduling example, that have something that is scheduled where there's a decent number of no-shows at those scheduled events, right? And so it's like, 
our sales team then had a, a playbook. They'd be able to go talk to a lot of different businesses, a lot of different folks, and be able to, to articulate the value um, of Twilio that was in a lot of ways independent of what the price of Twilio would be because, it, you know, the, the price of a, a penny for a text message relative to, you know, having a, a 20% reduction in no-shows um, is like not even comparable. And so, so those were sort of the, the ways that we tried to look at it is to get folks thinking less about like the cost of the, the underlying product, but more about the benefit they would receive in the long term by having, you know, uh, whatever the, the, the improvement is of, of the, that the product is that they're, they're adopting. And so those were some of the playbooks we would come up with. But I do think it's a challenge. Right. And I think, you know, they're, they're, um, the, the best way to do it is to come up with these for this particular use case. This is what we see from other customers. Um, and then also really being aggressive about saying, hey, we're, we want to be aligned with your, your business success. We don't want to be taking your money if you're not successful. And so why don't we try and figure out how we do a pilot here, um, uh, get you guys successful. Uh, we think there's going to be a ton of value that's created here and that, you know, in the long run, you're going to be a lot more focused on the value create side of this rather than the cost side of things and, uh, and get, that, get that going and get them successful. And I think that's sort of the magic of usage-based billing, which is at the end of the day, if they don't like it, they can stop using it. And, and it's not a giant commitment for them and, and, and the business overall. Yeah, I think those are, I think those are great points. Uh, and that kind of helps alleviate a lot of the customer uh, potential concerns. And then, you know, it, it, taking that example, so you might have a customer that starts with a proof of concept, maybe they're spending a thousand bucks. Over time, they might spend millions of dollars a year. Uh, how, you know, how do you think about the uh, financial aspect of managing a business with usage-based pricing when there's that uh, challenge around forecasting, you know, all, all of a sudden rev rec is, is more complicated. The KPIs you're measuring as a business aren't just kind of typical MRR, ARR, but there's a lot more nuances. Uh, what, what challenges have you had to navigate there? Yeah, I mean, we had a, a, a ton um, in the, the early Twilio days, um, um, just, just trying to figure out what the right model was, particularly, you know, as we were going at it at Twilio, there wasn't, you know, good, big public companies that were also doing this. And so we were trying to figure it out a, a little bit on our own. Um, uh, uh, when, when, when AWS was broken out of the overall Amazon bill and I think it was spring of 2015, that was sort of for us a, uh, a really great moment that sort of validated a lot of the hard work we were trying to do to get this, uh, this model right, just to be able to see, oh, wow, this is how it, how it grows with a, a, you know, a publicly traded company, um, uh, which was you know, our, our aspirations at, at the time. Uh, the, the thing I think first to just keep in mind is that this is not a product problem. It's not a finance problem. It's not an accounting problem. It's not a sales problem. This is a whole company um, a challenge that you all need to come together around to, to, to really embrace building and offering products to your customers in this way, right? Um, for example, let's just take a, a, a few here, right? Um, the predictability um, of these businesses, you know, it means that the CFO needs a lot more data scientists, a lot more analysts to try and sort of without a, a paper with a signed commitment from a customer that they're going to spend X amount of dollars over Y amount of time frame, they need to be modeling, right? Um, they need to be looking at this as a, a um, you know, a, an analytics problem uh, and coming up with a model um, and a range of outcomes that they think could be possible and trying to, to establish a budget within that range um, so that you can both aggressively invest in the business while you know not being uh, too aggressive about um, uh, your your investments um, uh, uh, going forward, and so uh, on the on the finance side, it's a lot more analysts, a lot more number crunching. Um, uh, it's not just looking at what do we see in Salesforce, how do we think that's going to um, uh, play out over time. On the sales side, it means you know a lot of the hard work your sales team is doing really isn't necessarily going to be recognized. Um, at you know contract close time, right? Um, uh, because contract close is like, hey, we got a pilot going, right? Um, uh, and we got we got something very basic started with this particular customer, and and these businesses grow at at really robust rates, uh, and so you need to think about that, right? You need to keep your sales team, sales getting that pilot going is immensely important for your business, right? And even if it isn't a, a you know a giant revenue win on day one. You need to make sure that you're compensating your reps, um, taking into account what that account could be over time, right? Um, and so, you know, getting customers successful is is a large part of what the, the the sales exercise is here, and making sure that your reps are compensated on getting that pilot out the door, getting that sort of initial usage based thing 
going so you get to start the clock on that compound interest right <laughs> um and so and you want to make sure that you're compensating with them in a way that that they're incentivized to go ahead and, and get customers started and get them successful um you also want to be thinking about how do i compensate reps on cross-selling to a new um SKU, a new use case within the organization in a way that you know i think is quite different than, than how you would have done this in a sort of more traditional subscription business right um and you know a lot of the work is done not just to get you know the ink on a uh, on a contract signed it, it's really in getting those customers successful and the type of reps that you hire actually even look quite a bit different right they're, they're ones that are really getting deep in with with those customers that understand their business that are consultative in their approach um and so it, it, it isn't none of these things are a specific um a problem for one part of the organization or another it's the whole organization needs to be working well together right you know our finance team was spending a ton of time getting the product usage metrics out of the systems that our, our product team were, were building. And, and, uh, and so you had uh, FP&A folks that were par paired deeply with our, our product organization to help try and do you know, forecasting. And forecasting wasn't you know, single account forecasting in the way that it, it, it typically is in organizations um, through your sales team. It was a combination of that with a combination of, of just looking at the numbers, right? And seeing, you know, how they grow over time and, and uh, trying to be predictive in, in terms of, of what that expansion is likely to look like uh, uh, over time. Yeah, I think those are all uh, great points. It, just to kind of add to it on the sales comp side, I think we're all used to compensating reps based on booking. So how much, what kind of commitment did you get for the customer, uh, from the customer? But in a usage-based model, the revenue, you know, might scale over time. You might, and might actually be best to start with that pilot or proof of concept. And if you just compensate based on those upfront bookings, your reps are going to be encouraged to go for too big of a deal that might be larger than a customer really needs, where they have a bunch of extra usage at the end of the period. And that has the kind of challenge of slowing down a sales cycle. And so I think compensating more of a balance of based on uh, consumption rec uh, revenue as it's recognized, plus the upfront commitment, just being mindful of doing what's kind of in the best interest of the customer and aligns the rep with the behavior that you want to drive, I think is better than kind of taking the, the standard approach. Uh, yeah, I, now, I think, I mean, just to really double click on that, a lot of this alignment is around, you know, the usage-based billing model aligns companies with their customers really, really well. And I think from that standpoint, you then need to work backwards and say, great, how do we make sure all the other parts of our organization are similarly aligned with customer success? Um, uh, and and that, that's why I love these types of businesses. It's why, you know, uh, since I've come over to the VC side of, of things, that's where I've been spending time and in, in, in the type of companies that I've been in, investing in um, have this usage-based component because I think ultimately it's not just a really good business where you see these great growth rates in, in these publicly traded companies, but it's also, uh, you know, these companies also have super high, you know, uh, NPS scores, right? They have really great customer sat because they are aligned at every part of the organization with the success of the customer. The sales team is aligned with getting usage um, going and getting their product, you know, whatever their integration is launched, right? Rather than just waiting, getting the signature and then, then sort of, you know, walking out the door. And so all these things are really about just shifting your entire organization to just be very, very customer aligned, which is, I think, great for building a long-term defensible business. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it's almost like, wh why do you need a renewal conversation? If the customer is just paying as they're seeing value, renewal is a non-event. Uh, customer will pay less if they're not successful, then they'll pay more if they, if they are. I, I think one thing that I've noticed, and curious if you've seen this too, is that uh, with a lot of usage-based businesses, it becomes a, uh, a whale and tail phenomenon where you're attracting a bunch of folks a lot of people end up kind of never paying a whole lot of money. Uh, maybe they're spending tens, hundreds, low thousands of dollars a year, but then a subset of them grow rapidly and end up spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. It's hard to necessarily predict going in who's going to see that rapid expansion versus who's not, not going, to, going to expand. And I guess I'm wondering if you see that and, and if so, kind of how do you think about uh, accommodating those kinds of patterns? So certainly, we saw that I'd say um, uh, in the, the very early days at, at um, um, Twilio, where you had a set of customers that got successful and and um, they grew really really large. 
I think one of the things that's important as you invest in the business is making sure uh, one, the, the, the value capture that you're taking from each customer is right size to, um, you know, the, the size of the account and, and the opportunity. And then I think also looking at like, well, what made those customers successful? Why, why did they grow the way that they grew? Uh, and what are other customers that would similarly see, see success with this product? Um, and then focusing your, you know, uh, distribution efforts on capturing more and more of those so that you don't find yourself in a whale and tail exclusively that you actually have a, a, a pretty heavy middle because you're repeating the pattern you've seen with the successful whales um, and you're applying that to other businesses and, and other opportunities that are that are out there. I think the long tail though is 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 fantastic part of these businesses. And so I think what, one of the things that that is really, really important is sure you're not monetizing that long tail particularly well. Um, but it also means that that you know those customers are happy to just have you for some small use case within their you know uh, team or their organization. They're trialing you out, and and those become you know uh, future opportunities um, uh, for the business, right? I, I sort of think about particularly as these horizontal developer platforms and and that that are sort of core infrastructure. Your customers teach you where the market opportunity is. Um, you know you're you're sort of solving for a basic need, storage, communication, compute, right? Uh, and customers are going to sort of show you where the best opportunity for compute is. And these change over time, right? Um, it, it was sort of, you know, initially what folks were doing with AWS is very different than how they're using GPU instances and, and, and you know, what, what things are being used for machine learning workloads that, that sort of change over time. And so I think customers um, will show you new opportunities in, in particularly in these horizontal infrastructure businesses, um, uh, businesses like AWS, like Twilio, like Snowflake, they will show you new opportunities for new types of workloads. Um, and frequently that starts happening first in that long tail. Someone's innovating, someone's trying something different. Um, they find success and one of those starts to grow. Uh, and then you realize like, wow, there's a lot of other companies that actually have this challenge, right? There's a lot of other companies that are sort of seeing these particular problems in the market. We, uh, a good example of that was at, at Twilio, we saw two-factor authentication become increasingly important use case, right? And, and you know, uh, certainly when, when we started out um, uh, building out the messaging product, we weren't targeting it for two-factor authentication. You know, our early customers were Beluga and GroupMe and, and folks that were doing group messaging and two-way communication. Uh, and then we started to see com companies like, you know, uh, Box that were launching things like two-factor authentication. We we're like, oh, wow, there, this is kind of a need for everyone out there that has a, um, uh, you know, a SaaS, SaaS offering. And, and, and so you then go and find, great, who else has that need? Oh, great, they already have an account. They've already done some testing with us. Great, now let's go ahead and engage with our um, sales team and figure out how we can make them successful uh, on the platform. And so a lot of what that sales effort is, is not net new sort of knocking on doors. And, and um, you know, it's actually just going back to that long tail and seeing who amongst that long tail really should be a whale. Um, and figuring out what's blocking them. Is it, you know, uh, someone on the, the engineering side that says, no, we can't use Twilio? Is it someone, you know, in legal that says, like, no, our data needs to stay on-prem or our data needs to stay in this particular region? Better understanding what those use cases are and then working together um, to get the, the, them unblocked. Well, when I have one other question and then we'll open it up to the group. And just as a reminder for folks, uh, put the questions in the Q&A area. If they're in the chat, they'll probably get lost uh, and won't have a chance to answer them. And so, yeah, Pat, final question for you, Patrick, is now that you have the investor hat on, what are some of the ways that you evaluate usage-based companies? What are the things that you're looking for or that you think they should be tracking? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I talked on a, a few of these earlier around sort of the, the expansion rates and dollar-based and account-based churn. I think though, just at its core, I mean, what we're doing at Matrix, we, we primarily are doing seed and series A investing. Um, it's just very, very early stage. And I think it's at its core, it's a lot harder for someone to uh, spend their time um, uh, using your product than it is often to get revenue. And so I always tell folks like, figure out first how we get folks to engage with us, to start driving usage on our platform um, uh, and solve a hard problem for customers. And, and, and over time, I feel confident if, you know, the, the companies that, that um, uh, we're investing in are so solving hard problems for customers. Customers are willing to spend time and use the product that you can monetize that um, uh, over time. And so I really focus early on, which is just, can you get folks using the product um, rather than can you get a, 
I will use it, and here's a you know a, a, a 50k LOI, right? Uh, I'm a lot more interested in how companies are spending their time um, and where they're voting, you know, their most precious resource, which is their time, not their dollars these days, rather than um, uh, just sort of like what contracts you can get signed in, in, in early on. And so, you know, as I think about it, I, that's sort of the, the stuff I look for really, really early on. You know, it's not a question of you know how many accounts do you have. It's do you have a few accounts that are that absolutely love the product and you're using it um, uh, quite a bit? Uh, those are sort of the early indicators of success. And and from that base, you can go take that you know story of a of a few accounts that are wildly successful and using the product a ton. You can figure out all right, great. How do we maybe modify our pricing to drive more revenue? How do we reach more of these types of customers over time? Um, but but I think that's sort of the core I'm looking for is just you know wildly happy. Um, customers that are using, you know, the, the product or service that you're offering uh, in the early um, early innings, and and I think revenue and and um, uh, some of the other stuff that that investors typically look for, I think those can happen over time, and and more than happy to take a bet on a founder and, and work with them on how how you figure out um, uh, those those other elements of the business over time. If you've got wildly successful customers that are, you know, voting with their most precious resource, their time, to, to, and actually using the product. Yep. Awesome. Well, uh, there's a bunch of questions. Uh, a number of them are actually about blending uh, subscription or recurring revenue with usage revenue. I think there's a couple of flavors of the question. One is whether to have some sort of hybrid model where there's a base subscription fee with usage on top of that. Um, and another is kind of around this idea of how, do, I guess, when do you flip the switch from usage to subscription uh, revenue and you know, should you try to move deals into uh, kind of more predictable recurring revenue streams? Uh, we'd love to hear your your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think let's take sort of the first uh, first part about that. Uh, the first question, which is sort of around, um, you know, the the it sounded like it was around subscription um, uh, versus usage and and sort of when to choose each. I think to me it comes down to a um, uh, you want to lower barriers of entry for products, um, particularly ones that have sort of a, a ubiquitous need. Um, I think this is a little bit different. There's, you know, products that are ubiquitous in need. I'd say communications, you know, payments that, that are, are, are quite ubiquitous. And there's a set of products where there's a, a small number of customers. And, and I think for those products, you know, you know exactly who the, the accounts are. You can reach out directly and an outbound motion works fine. And I think, you know, starting with a subscription model is okay if it is a, a less ubiquitous model. But I think for products and services that are ubiquitous in nature, um, I honestly think usage-based is, is the right approach to go. And, and, um, and, and a lot of what you're doing is sort of lowering the barriers of entry where you have a free tier where folks can just get started. And, and if it's a, a product that's applicable to almost everyone, there's really no downside in, in you doing that and seeing who gets successful with your product and who doesn't. Worst case scenario, people aren't getting successful and you go call them up and say, hey, you know, why, why didn't you use, why did you churn, you know, why are you sort of stuck at this rate? And you get to learn something as, as you're building out that business. And so I sort of think about it from that lens of, is this a ubiquitous need? Um, or are there sort of just a, a name list of customers that have this problem? Um, uh, we can call all of them up and, and, uh, and we know exactly what the value is to each of these, these customers. I think for that, I think actually subscriptions is a, a, a plenty fine way to um, go about acquiring those customers, right? Um, uh, you, you understand what value is, you're able to price effectively, um, and you're able to go out down and, and um, offer them a, a, a good uh, you know, price per value um, opportunity. I think on the usage side, when it's a ubiquitous use case, you really don't want to, in my opinion, have any sort of barriers to, to using the product or entry, right? Um, uh, and I think sometimes folks throw an initial subscription on, which is like, hey, well, I want to get some dollars out of my long tail. I think it's a lot more important that you get your long tail successful and spending big dollars than trying to monetize um, uh, the long tail. And so I, I would highly encourage you to, to, if it is a ubiquitous need, not to, to worry about sort of the revenue leakage in that tail, instead to worry about how do I make that tail successful whales. <laughs> Um, uh, and anything that is a barrier to doing that, I think, is, is um, something that you want to be figuring out and solving for the business. And sometimes I think an artificial subscription fee might you know, trick you into thinking you're actually getting successful and, and, and really you're not. You're, you're, just, you're not succeeding in making customers successful. You're just succeeding in you know, monetizing your, your tail a little bit better, which I think ultimately isn't what, what generates really, really big businesses over time. Yeah, I've noticed similar things that it kind of speaks to this like whale and tail phenomenon where 
generally uh, those small paying customers are not actually generating the majority of your revenue. And so if you're trying to move them onto some, some, some subscription with a minimum, uh, that's actually not gonna move the needle on revenue all that much. It's better to open up the access to your product, allow more people in, and then really work on uh, product engagement, customer success, get those, those kind of tail of user successful, knowing that they'll expand pretty dramatically in time. And, and so trying to be punitive and add, add you know, subscription fees for them is kind of a short-term way of optimizing for revenue versus looking at the business uh, over the long term. We, we yeah, and of, I mean, just practically, yeah. like your sales team trying to sell into someone that has a trial going on, maybe for a small use case in their organization, is uh, it's way easier for a sales team to sell into that type of a customer than it is for them to sort of sell net new, sell folks with you know some some starting price that that uh, is a barrier. Um, is like for, focus on getting them successful, um, even if it's for if it's for a small use case. Um, Driving that success will drive trust in the, the nature of the relationship between you and that particular um, company. And then it will be much, much easier for your, um, uh, your, your, your sales team thereafter to help you know, expand from there. Um, I do think it's important, though, that it does require um, you, know, uh, you to be aligned with your investors on this. Because, as I said, it's compound interest. And it's, it's really great when the numbers are big because you're able to grow them at a, at a very healthy clip. And you see this when you look at the AWS line item, you see this when you look at, 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 at Twilio and you see this when you look at Snowflake. But early on, it's that same growth rate um, actually is applying early on where you would expect it to be super high. And so uh, unlike the way this used to happen where you would have these super high growth rates and then they would sort of tail off because the majority of the growth was generated by your distribution effort. Uh, this is a little bit different. And you need um, you know, a set of investors that are patient, that understand the model, that are willing to, to sort of say like, great, I'd much rather have a high growth rate at 100 million in revenue than a high growth rate at a million in revenue, <laughs> and uh, um, uh, and that that requires you know patient investors and and uh, and your management team to be patient too. Yeah, I think that's true of most kind of bottom up or product led businesses. Uh, that that kind of phenomenon. There were a few questions around metering and billing. So you know the usage based product does require more probably in the MVP around thoughtful uh, kind of usage metering, sharing analytics around usage behavior in-app, uh, making sure that there's meter billing in place. I guess, what uh, what do you think of as like, what's part of the MVP for that, for a usage-based product? What's And what's the investment um, that folks should be looking at? Yeah, it, it is not trivial, right? The usage-based metering is is uh, quite difficult. We, we had a pretty sizable team um, at Twilio that was exclusively focused on this. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I, it is not a, a simple investment. The way I tell folks, particularly in the infrastructure space to think about this is, you know, if you're building infrastructure that others are going to depend on, um, like Snowflake, like AWS, like Twilio, like Stripe, um, well, it, it's probably worth the effort to overinvest in metering and measuring your services, <laughs> um, not just for the ability to bill, but for the ability to understand what's happening, to understand if there's any downtime, because a, a big part of what you're selling in these products is, is frankly trust, right? They're outsourcing, uh, uh, you know, you become one of their microservices um, um, uh, when, you, when you build the, these, these products. Um, and so you're, you're really part of their product. And so I, I do, do tell folks, like, I would overinvest in how you uh, meter your product, both from better understanding uptime and availability of the services that you're, you're, you're offering, um, and from from also sort of metering the, the, those products uh, effectively. Uh, and I think it just takes more time. I think sort of the era of, hey, we got our MVP out in like two months and we're solving a really hard problem for customers. I, I don't think that that era exists anymore, right? That, you know, two months when we built this mobile app and now it's blowing up, a lot of that lower hanging fruit has been picked. And so I think it does take to get to that initial MVP where you're really able to prove it out and solve a real hard problem for customer. I think increasingly we look at our seeds at, at Matrix we expect, hey, it's going to take 18 months, sometimes two years to, to, to really nail that MVP. And, and um, uh, certainly, you know, uh, that, that's sort of what we've seen play out. And I think there's risk in trying to get that out there when you haven't actually delivered on the core value prop of, of, uh, of the product. And, and so, so we tell folks, you know, take the time and do it right. And I think the other thing is, right, the thing I really care about is, is usage in the early days, not even the revenue. And so, 
if your you know ability to meter at fractions of a penny uh, and drive you know revenue dollars from that is is tricky and figure out how I do taxes for that there's a lot of complicated things you need to do to do that correctly um, well great like let's just put them on a, a a fixed fee if they go over then the customer gets the benefit of it for now um, uh, and let's get them using the product because the thing I really care about is how they vote with their most precious resource. It's their time, right? And so if they integrated with that API and they're using it every day, that to me matters a lot more than, than, than the revenue. And so if you're going to skimp on anything, it's, you know, it, we can figure out revenue collection later um, uh, and figure out where the revenue leakage is in, in our products uh, as, as long as we're getting customers successful and they're happy using the product. Yeah, and I think one thing I'd add is that a lot of the kind of large at scale companies with usage based billing have pretty sizable billing teams that and kind of think about the customer's usage and billing experience as a core product function. But there are more and more startups that are helping uh, you know companies address this in a more turnkey way. So Chargeify and Chargebee have both invested kind of substantially in their usage based billing capabilities. And the, the nice thing is that there's now more off the shelf tooling than there used to be. Uh, now, we got a, a few questions around uh, investor pushback, and I, and I thought that we've done a good job of like getting people not as concerned about this, but folks have said in investor discussions, the investors only seem to care about MRR. Uh, how do you ma manage those conversations, and uh, I think how, how do you make this story resonate with, with other investors who are not, you know, don't think this the way we do? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, a lot of that comes from folks just pattern matching on what was successful sort of in the last generation of SaaS, which is exactly, you know, the, the metrics that many are focused on now. And I, I would just really, really encourage you to share with your investors, you know, the, the quarterly statements that come out of companies like Twilio, um, uh, companies that have sort of embraced this model um, and, and really have them take a look at how those companies are doing it and, and what their growth rates look like at very, very large numbers. I mean, Twilio and AWS have been able to, to, to have huge growth rates at, at you know, very, very large numbers because a lot of that work on the growth side is done by their customers, right? It's the success of their customers and there's customer businesses that are growing. And so um, for me, that's sort of where I, I would start is, is um, just showing them public companies that are doing it, that are executing on this. This isn't, you know, some sort of... Uh, uh, Secret, secret sauce anymore. I think, you know, when, when, you know, in 2015 at Twilio, we were struggling because we didn't have a lot of public comps to, to point at. Um, and, and we thought a lot about different t-shirt sizing of, of the product to, 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 to try and map to what the investment world knew. But, but I, I don't think that's the case anymore. I think there are a lot of successful public companies that you can point at that have really embraced this model. Um, uh, and, uh, and you'll see a whole bunch of things. It, it means you have a super efficient cost of sale because that, that tail Right. When your sales team is going and selling, they're selling into the tail. They're not selling into net new um, uh, or they're cross selling into an existing account. And so it's sort of how you use your sales team that changes ultimately. And you can make businesses that are um, uh, quite efficient from a, a, a distribution standpoint. So that would be my my advice is is I'd encourage you to just share that with your investors and, and really internalize what those companies are doing and and, um, and and how it might be applicable to your your business model. Well, I. Uh... One another question is around free products and how they fit into usage-based models. And uh, so someone asked, is it better to have uh, small limits or limited features uh, for a customer, have a trial period on usage-based models, uh, credits, uh, the, just a few words on the best way to layer in a free plan into these models? Yeah, I mean, we certainly started with credits at um, uh, Twilio was sort of the, the, the path that we went down. Credits are tricky because it's another level of complexity in your billing system that you need to solve for because um, uh, I need to track how many credits you had, even if you're giving away um, uh, free credits. I, I think ultimately the, the model that I like best um, uh, is just the generous free tier um, and to not sort of try and meter, you know, and, and put pricing on too many different knobs of the, the, the product. Um, it's just let them use a, a free tier. If they're trying it out, it should be free to try it out, right? Um, and so for some products, that means like, great, you know, for the first five users, this is going to be a, a free service. For some, it's, you know, the first X number of transactions, this is going to be a free service. But rather than limit what the product can do, 
Um, uh, I think it's way better just to limit them, you know, to, to, to sort of meter on the number of, of transactions that they're doing within the product, because what you really want as part of that, that, that trial offering is you want them to understand what the boundaries of that product, what that product can do, right? You want to be able to understand, oh, I could do this and I could do this and I could do that. And you want, you want folks to be able to sort of explore all the capabilities your product has to offer. And if they're not, you know, launching with it, you shouldn't be trying to make money off of them um, for it. You, you just want to encourage their exploration of, of what your product offering is. And so I, I'm very much in favor of a free tier. Um, in fact, I, I really like a free tier in perpetuity, um, uh, you know, the same way that sort of AWS really sort of pioneered this, where it's like, if your usage is over X um, uh, per month, then it's like, great, you continue to have um, uh, free usage of, of the service offering. Uh, because it then stays top of mind, you know, uh, particularly for developer platforms. A lot of developers have ideas and they play around with them at home. And, you know, like my first Twilio app, for example, was I, I built like a, a doorbell buzzer for my apartment building in, in Seattle when I was working at Microsoft. Uh, it was actually how I found out about, about Twilio, right? And it was, you know, my friends would, I needed a Seattle area code and I bought a Twilio number in Seattle. Um, and then I uh, had a mechanism for them to basically buzz themselves up to my uh, uh, apartment building. And if that wasn't accessible and able to just sort of be there and, and operate for little or nothing for me, um, then Twilio wouldn't have been top of mind, right? And so, uh, and then later on, as you encounter problems where like, oh, wow, communications could actually help with this business use case, um, it was top of mind. And so I, I think generous free tiers are, are quite, quite useful. And, and as I said, you want to make sure that when customers launch, in fact, when customers launch, they want to be paying you too, because they want to be able to call you up. They want to have a support agreement in place. They want to know that you're going to answer the phone and that you're motivated to, to help them um, uh, be successful if there's ever a problem. And so, um, so yes, I'm very much in favor of, of a, a generous free tier that lets them use all the parts of the product um, uh, because it's, it's part of your sales process. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think you and I agree on a lot of stuff. When you even see that in models like Slack, which charges based on the user, they'll have a generous free tier where you can do a lot. If you can invite as many people as you want into, into Slack. And if Slack goes from this place where teams kind of casually interact to a place where your mission critical business information lives, that's when you run into the usage based paywall, which is how many, uh, what kind of volume of messages they're going to store for you that you can search through and have access to. And so that's, that's a great kind of specific compelling event that lets the customer know, okay, now is time to convert. Uh, and they're able to do that while still offering a pretty generous free experience. And so I think that you can make the customer feel like free is great, has, has a high NPS without hurting your free to paid uh, conversion rate. And, you know, we're getting close on, on time. I, I think that uh, we, there's one more question I'd I like to just add. And, and I think it's important in this discussion is when you have these models that are like compound interest where the customer starts small, uh, it can be difficult to measure things like CAC or LTV to CAC. Uh, and how do you think about uh, CAC specifically for a usage-based model and what, what healthy is? Yeah, it, it is super difficult. Um, uh, I, I think in the, the, I sort of separated between sort of the phase of the company. In the early days, I just don't think you're really going to have a handle on that. And so uh, like it just realistically, you know, so much of the growth comes two years out, three years out. And when the company has been around for, you know, the product's been launched for eight months. It's really, really hard to have a, a handle on what that looks like. And so I think a lot of this is just sort of the time horizon you're measuring. Um, so early on, it's our customers spending time. Are they wildly happy uh, and successful with the product and, and really, really focusing on that in the early days? I think later on, what you'll find is that like CAC LTV is super efficient if your expansion rates hold up. And so that's why, you know, trying to measure what the expansion rate is um, early on is, is I think the most important thing because, you know, that LTV, if you have you know, compound interest, the good news about it is from an LTV standpoint, um, it generates a, a ton of value for you later on. And so I really care about what that, what we think that expansion rate looks like for most customers. Um, uh, and then you'll find that like, actually you can afford a, a, a lot of dollars on, on the CAC side because LTV becomes very, very large at the two year mark, at the two and a half year mark, at the three year mark. And so um, uh, if you have low churn and you have a high expansion rate, the, the LTV kind of thing solves, it sort of solves for itself. Um, uh, and so that, that's why I focus on those uh, early on. Yeah, I think those are great. Uh, I just threw in, in the chat, uh, a link to a piece I just wrote on this topic. Cause I think it's really timely, but 
I think uh, for me also, when you're looking at usage-based models, product and engineering might also be part of your CAC. And so sure. that's just something for folks to consider is that your product efforts are meant to help drive more usage, more use cases, uh, customers being successful. And so there's kind of a new set of metrics where you probably want to think beyond CAC towards things that are more relevant uh, for the business. But that's all we, we have. I know we're at the, the top of the hour. Uh, and I guess, Patrick, for folks who want to follow you or learn more, where, uh, where should they go? Yeah, just uh, if you ever are interested in, in chatting, um, my email is patrick at matrixpartners.com. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, um, just Patrick Malatak. <laughs> um, uh, at Patrick Malatak is, is uh, the best place to get in touch with me. And, um, and if you, you know folks that are embracing sort of usage-based uh, billing, I'd love to chat with them. And, and, and companies that are helping sort of drive the usage-based economy, I think are really interesting um, businesses to invest in. And so um, uh, please send them my way. And I and, uh, was really happy to, to be able to, to do this with you, Kyle, and, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, likewise. And then for folks interested in more, uh, I'm posting about usage-based pricing pretty regularly on LinkedIn. You can find me at Kyle Poyer, and we've got a uh, usage-based pricing playbook at OpenView that I can, I can share. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I need some traction. 